Hello everyone and welcome to the first of our research seminars for 2021 and a happy new year um, and uh, for us it's been a bit of a funny one in the UK because we've just gone into a long lockdown but I'm so pleased that so many of you can come along. Um, we're just starting a, I should say, my name's, if you haven't been before, my name's Sue Sentence, I'm from Raspberry Pi Foundation, I generally chair these. So this is the beginning of a new series of seminars we've got. We did uh, last year, for those of you who came along, we had lots of different topics, it was great. And we're currently writing those up into a sort of a proceedings of those. Uh, this year we're focusing on diversity and inclusion from now until June. And so this is the first one of these um, seminars. And we're delighted that we're doing this collaboratively with the Royal Academy of Engineering, um, who have a great interest in diversity and inclusion, and so we're really happy to be partnering with them for these seminars. Um, the format is as usual, the talks, uh, the talk will be 40 minutes-ish. I will start waving if it gets much longer at Billy and Peter. And then we're going to split into breakouts as we normally do for 15, 20 minutes and then come back for a, um, a, a, a Q&A. And the idea of the breakouts is that you, everybody gets a chance to talk to each other, um, can meet new friends, share their thoughts on it and then formulate really well thought, good questions for the speakers so we can carry on having a good discussion. So without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce Peter and Billy. Peter is Peter Kemp is uh, from King's College London, has uh, which is where I worked before um, I came to Raspberry Pi Foundation. So I'm I'm very familiar with where Peter works, uh, but he comes um, with a, a great reputation in the, the work he's done on um, gender and um, uh, particularly gender in computing education, and he's um, just recently received his PhD. Is that right, Philip, Peter? Yep. So congratulations for that. And also Billy, who's written widely about um, uh, underrepresented groups um, from the University of Reading. So over to you, you can share your screen now. Welcome everybody, welcome to my very small office. And uh, you know, it's uh, very dark out here in the UK and we've got people here from all over the world. So what I'm gonna try and do tonight is talk to you a little bit about computing education for underrepresented groups with this particular focus on um, what we've been doing over in England. Um, and I'm going to talk you through some of the stats behind that, some uh, so kind of the picture of how computing education is being received by different groups and different groups access to computing education. And Billy's going to try and talk to you through some of the reasoning um, we think we, you know, we believe that this reasoning behind why this is. Um, so um, first of all, what I'm going to try and cover in this seminar is the curriculum change in England. Um, so we have a focus on England, we have a really rich data set in England with the National People Database. And uh, this allows us to look at the results and the kind of the access for students all over the country um, every year going back to 2001. Um, we're gonna be looking at particular underrepresented groups, uh, in particular uh, tonight, female, gender, um, ethnicity, poverty indicators, um, special educational needs um, a little bit and inter intersectionality between these groups. Uh, and we also going to try and cover whether the shift towards computer science was equitable. So um, I'm going to give you a little bit of the background behind the curriculum change in England and you know, kind of talking how it's going. Um, limitations from what I'm talking about tonight. Uh, there's very little data from 2020 and 2020 onwards. Uh, you know, with the current situation, um, data has not been so freely available for the last two years. Um, and uh, we say so looking at England only in, in particular, a focus here on the GCSE, which is a qualification that students take at age 16. If uh, if I'm going to try and uh, introduce you to, you know, if I'm using terminology that you don't understand, um, so you're welcome to you know shout at me. Um, but I'm hopefully going to give you an introduction to how you know all this if GCSE A level stuff works in England. So um, a potted history of English uh, computing education. You see computers appearing in schools in the 1960s. In uh, kind of 72, 75, we have qualification introduced. An age 16 qualification. Um, the BBC Micro takes um, you know, quite a big uh, you know, stance in the, in the 1980s, uh, introducing computing into, into primary and secondary schools. And this computing slowly, or computer science, computer studies, um, slowly kind of mutates into this thing called IT. And in 1995, you have a national curriculum subject called IT, which is around the more around the application 
um, of computing technologies to everyday life. So uh, you might think more about office usage, um, though, you know, this is quite questionable. We're not going to get into the details here, but th there were certainly parts which uh, you'd recognize computer science in the old ITT curriculum. Um, so and and there's a, a growing disquiet through the kind of the early 2000s um, with this qualification. Some people think it's not uh, fit for purpose. And then um, Eric Schmidt, from the Google CEO, uh, gives a lecture in 2011 saying he can't believe that computer science isn't being taught in in British schools. And this this kind of kicks off uh, quite a bit of research and and this movement to get more computer science into schools. Um, and we're going to be digging into a little bit into the the corporate influence on the curriculum a little bit later. So the Royal Society report comes along and um, and it suggests that we have this computing equals CSIT, which literally I'll cover in a second. And that there's quite a, a big um, kind of political movement behind this. Anybody who's watching, you know, been watching Brexit quite closely might recognise this man. This is one of the kind of the, the flag bearers for Brexit, um, Michael Gove, who was the education secretary. And, um, you know, some quotes from several of his speeches, uh, ICT, well, the old IT curriculum, university acknowledges and ambitious, demotivating and dull. Again, we're going to try and question this a little bit later. Um, and ICT, looking at how to do word processing and spreadsheeting over and over again. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with either of those things, um, but the, the idea was there was a bit too much of it. So the Royal Society suggests this model. And we get rid of ICT. We don't want to use the word ICT anymore because it's a bit of a, uh, you know, a bad term um, and people don't like the term ICT. So we, we call this new subject computing and we're looking to split it into three areas, overlapping areas, computer science, digital literacy and information technology. Um, a nice easy way uh, from um, Peter Twining and Miles Berry to understand this is computer science being the the foundations of how computers work, so programming in, you know, details on how computers themselves function um, and the maths behind computing uh, as examples. Um, information technology, the application of computing to everyday life, so the old ICT curriculum, quite similar with some of the information technology areas, and digital literacy being the implications of computing uh, on you know, everyday life and society, um, and that's that's roughly the model that was adopted by the um, by the English uh, Department for Education. And we, so we're going to dig into this a little bit more later. Um, so we have a with the Royal Society um, writing that report, we have a new curriculum put together. This new subject called computing, of which computer science is part of it. We get rid of ICT, um, and then you know to such an extent that the the Department for Education have a GCSE and an A level in computer science but they refuse to renew the ICT, A-level and GCSE. Um, so these are the main qualifications that students sit, um, GCSE at age 16, A-level uh, at age 18, kind of the key to university. Um, they refuse to have ICT as on kind of the same level as those, uh, as, GCSE, as computer science at A-level and GCSE. So we, we, we kind of jettison the computer science side. Um, and then, uh, you know, various other issues happened and we end up in 2018 with the National Centre, uh, of which the Raspberry Pi is part of, um, being set up uh, to help deliver this new computing um, programme of study, this new computing curriculum, um, but with a, uh, a focus dictated by the government um, on trying to get more computer science GCSE in schools and to upskill 8,000 computer science teachers. Um, but at the same time, the National Centre is doing a lot of work around general computing with the information technology and the digital literacy elements in there too. Um, so um, I'm here to talk a little bit about what's the impact of this been uh, on various groups. So we'll get stuck into this with looking at some kind of headline figures. Um, and this is, you know, one of the most worrying graphs. So you've got here, I'm just going to see if I can get my cursor to do fancy things. Here we go. So you've got uh, from 2007 going all the way through to 2020. Um, and the blue line is overall qualifi qualifications. And the green line is the GCSE and ICT and the GCSE in computer science. Um, and you can see there's a, there's a big gap between the two. These are other general qualifications which do exist, which aren't GCSEs. Um, so this is, this is just looking at the um, education space for 16 year olds. And as you can see, we've got a really steep decline in the overall number of qualifications. Now, there might be some data missing here, which is why I put it in a, in a grey block. But you're going to see in the next graph that this is probably pretty representative of what's going on. We've seen a huge decrease in the number of qualica qualifications being sat. We can see the ICT, you see, completely disappearing because of, you know, it was disapplied in 2017. Two years later, nobody's sitting it. 
Um, and the computer science qualification is, you know, has risen and it's above the level that it used to be for ICT. So that's a good thing. Um, but the last year of data that we do have in this was actually a, a small decline um, in the number of people sitting um, at computer science. And in terms of the green line, quite gender balanced. In terms of the blue line, you know, quite gender balanced. The red line, the you know, the only line that seems to be kind of stabilizing, um, is you know, pretty dominated by males. We'll look into that in a bit more detail in a second. So why do I think that this um, this graph is pretty representative? It's mostly because of this. Um, and these are the overall figures that we have uh, for the number of hours being taught. So there's a census that happens each year in schools and you get a rough figure of the number of hours of computing being taught. Um, and we can see since 2013, the curriculum change is actually 2012, 2013. The curriculum change was introduced here um, and you know we've seen decreases at key stage three, four and five and key stage three is your 11 to 14 category, key stage four is 14 to 16 and key stage five is 16 to 18. These aren't qualifications, these are actually you know, kind of raw numbers of hours and there's been you know, a huge, huge decrease across all these different levels which is you know, deeply concerning and uh, some of the analysis that we did um, for this year this 2019 data set um, suggested that students who weren't doing the GCC, um, I shouldn't say computer, yeah, sorry, I should say computing, who weren't doing the GCC in computer science were getting an average about nine minutes of, of computing education a week, which um, for most would mean nothing. Um, and, you know, we, we are very concerned that there are many students who are, are now getting no digital qualification at all in schools. So um, looking a little bit more at the GCC in computer science, uh, we can see here, um, this is the figures for 2019. Um, and you've got 81% of students in a school where computer science is being, um, is on offer, uh, which is you know, quite good. 64% of providers are offering it. Um, and 81% of students could potentially sit it, but it's not as easy as that because you might be in a school and you could sit it, but they're not gonna let you sit it because you're not good to go enough at maths or something like that. Um, so we can break this figure down into different school types and uh, what we do have here is we've got comprehensive which is a, a term that means basically state schools, these are state funded schools and there's a special form of state funded schools called grammar schools and these are selective schools so these are state funded schools where you have to sit some sort of selection criteria to get in and as you can see the, the best representation here is amongst the grammar schools so the grammar schools are doing quite a good job of offering computer science um, and in a sense it seems to be becoming a little bit more elitist though the numbers aren't hugely different. Um, but the grammar schools are, you know, are well ahead in terms of um, students who go to a grammar school, those who are more academically able uh, are able to sit computer science. If you go into a comprehensive school or normal state school, um, you're not able to sit it. And our independent, our private schools down here don't seem to be hugely interested in computer science. It's a, it's a bit unclear as to why that is. Um, so what this impact, the, the impact of change over the last, um, you know, seven, eight years, um, we see, you know, in particular, fewer girls sitting any sort of digital qualification. And I'm not just talking about computer science here, I'm talking about general qualifications, and we'll see in a second what I mean by that. Um, and, you know, I'm also speculating that we're seeing uh, fewer um, you know, black students sitting computing qualifications and also students from poor backgrounds. And as you can probably guess, if you're looking at academic selection, you're probably um, indirectly discriminating against students from poor backgrounds who wouldn't be able to afford uh, to move to an area where there is a grammar school or who wouldn't be able to afford the coaching to get into the schools. And that's you know the, the number of free school meal kids we're gonna look at in a second. The number of poor students in grammar school is very low. So um, boys and girls, um, kind of the, these figures are you know a little bit rough but generally with the computer science you see we're looking about you know one in five students being female um, and it was about you know 40 43 percent um, of the old ICT qualification so we haven't seen the girls who had previously have taken ICT shifting over to taking GCC computer science which means these girls with the uh, statistics we just did um, are likely to be getting nothing when they would previously have had an ICT qualification at that um, at that level and that's you know really really worrying. The A level is even even worse than say A level is your your gateway qualification to university, um, which is uh, when you're 18. So uh, the figures here are a little bit out of date because I am behind with my uh, analysis here. Um, but we have 2014 to 17. So in 2014, 42 percent of girls were sitting a digital qualification. It doesn't have to be computer science. It could be something um, called you know, even ECDL or ICT or some other other qualification in uh, in sort of digital um, skills. 
And this dropped substantially to 34% um, when you get to 2017. And that, that is this line here, but you can see, see the, the blue line is quite high. This blue line then decreases massively. And with the decrease here of the green line and the blue line, I'm expecting that this figure is gonna be much, much lower. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the stats on that, but you know, speculative, you know, I would, I would probably put money on this number being considerably lower than it currently is. Um, but the boys, about 50% of boys, stays relatively steady, 50% of boys taking digital qualification over the last um, couple of years. Um, and you can go and take your state schools, here are your state schools, selective and non-selective, and your private schools, you can split them into different types of school. Um, so in terms of the GCSE, um, computer science, we've got Girls' schools, you know, uh, you know, a much lower percentage of um, schools are actually offering the uh, the GCSE. Okay, so seventy five percent of girls' comprehensive schools are offering the GCSE. Um, it's eighty six percent of boys' comprehensive schools. Um, and you know, in England, we do have all boys' schools, all girls' schools, and mixed schools. Um, now, this is uh, worrying, and one thing that isn't shown on here is the fact that in I think two years ago, um, out of this, you know, it's like seventy five percent. I think it was 19% of those schools actually dropped it in a year. So even though these schools are offering it, they seem to be picking it up and dropping it quite quickly. And you know, a lot of the work the Rice Pi Foundation and the National Centre are doing is to upskill teachers. And it might well be that they can't find this teaching staff. It might well be that the girls are doing really badly when they uh, when they take the course. And we're going to have a look at the um, the outcomes in a second. Um, and girls grammar school is obviously doing better, but nothing compared to what the boys grammar schools are doing in terms of the, the percentage of all students taking it. So they, they're offering it quite well, but actually the girls aren't picking it up to the same extent that the boys are. So um, poverty indicators. Now, um, please bear with me. We've got quite a few acronyms to explain. Um, so we've got this pupil, or, you know, terminology, pupil premium decile. Um, in England, if your family, um, your mother and father, or you know, if you're in care, um, you are uh, earning a certain amount of your care, you get put onto free school meals. So um, what we can do is we can take all the schools in the country, we can um, split them into 10 groups uh, based on how rich the in how rich the intake is so um on number one these are the students who probably aren't on free school meals at all um and over here these are the schools which are serving the poorest communities so here's serving the richest communities here serving the poorest communities and it's a very clear trend here that the the rich the school the more likely it is to be offering computer science so if you're from a poor background living in a poor area um it's likely that your school is not going to be offering computer science which means even if you want to do it you can't um and there are obviously you know other uh, potential discrimination three activities happening inside schools but you know just on a, on a school level if you're from a poorer background if you're living in a poorer area it's less likely you're going to be um sitting in a computer so you're in a school which is offering computer science gcc which is um you know pretty concerning um another way of splitting the uh you know looking at poverty is looking at idaki idaki is an indicator of the the wealth of the area not the wealth of your parents but the wealth of the area that you're growing up in based on your postcode or zip code in american terminology um so what you have here is we are looking at the computer science uptake and this is you know quite an interesting finding that we found that we discovered uh about a year and a half ago, which is if you're coming, um, if you're female um, and you're coming from a poorer background, um, so the tens of the, the poorest group of students and the uh, the ones of the, the students living in the richest areas, um, well, actually, the poorer the female, the more likely that female is to be taking computer science GCSE. This isn't what we were expecting to see, but there, there seems to be some, you know, some kind of odd thing happening in the background here where, you know, poorer girls seem to be seeing computer science as a uh, as a good choice of subject. And we're not quite sure why this, this is something that we are going to be exploring in the near future. Um, you can see the error bars here on the, um, on the male line. It's, it's not so clear for the males, but certainly, uh, you know, the richer the girl is, uh, the less likely she's going to be taking computer science. And we're not quite sure why that is. Uh, and as you can see over here, this is the kind of comparison with ICT for the same year. And again, big error bars over here. You know, it's, uh, it's not quite the same picture. So uh, looking at ethnicity, well, um, again, the data on this is a little bit outdated, I'm afraid, but what we do have going up to 2017 is we, we see the, um, the Chinese uh, population, um, you know, one in four students from Chinese heritage backgrounds are, um, are choosing to take computer science or, you know, they're you know, being asked to take computer science, they feel other pressure than taking computer science, but computer science is very popular amongst Chinese students, which wasn't the case for ICT. 
Um, I see the, you know, the lines are really close together. The, uh, so this is the kind of the old ICT uptake over here. And as you can see here, the, uh, the line at the bottom are black students. And um, some of you might be surprised that we, we split Chinese and Asian. Um, but what we do in the UK is we actually have a separate category in the National Pupil Database for Chinese students and Asian students. Um, and you know, the Chinese students well ahead up here and the black students um, you know, at the bottom where they, they weren't there previously. So you know, the, the shift to computer science does seem to be having a, a kind of a negative impact on um, black students in terms of the uptake of a digital GCSE qualification. And we can look a little bit intersectionality here. So we can look at um, gender, we can look at poverty, um, and we can look at you know, subjects. And what your, uh, sorry, ethnicity as well. And you're seeing that maybe looking at this graph here, uh, this, this trend might be largely explained by um, working class white girls. Uh, you know, there, there doesn't seem to be so much of a trend in the other um, ethnic uh, categories. Uh, and, you know, again, we're not quite sure why that is the case. It's something which we need to explore. Um, you know, the, in terms of the statistical models, these aren't great statistical models. It's something which we, we probably need a lot more um, kind of qualitative data to really dig into what these, this reasoning is. So um, special educational needs in, in England, uh, there are many categories of special ed educational need. Uh, and you know, this might be students with visual impairment, uh, mobility issues, might be students with um, autism spectrum disorder, um, categorizations and so on. Um, and again, this is a little bit of date, but there are some interesting things popping out here. So this is the GCSE, you've got the old ICT qualification, which is pretty close. The red line is the, the population. The ICT qualification is relatively close to the old uh, population data and the computer science data is, is lower. The reason this, this, you know, the overall population is going down is because the government's making it harder for students to be categorized as having SEND needs, um, uh, which is you know, quite, quite worrying. Um, but you can see in terms of um, accessibility, certainly up to 2017, computer science was not being as equitable as ICT. Um, interestingly, and I've included the A-level here, and just reminding you, A-level is our gateway qualification to degree level, uh, taken at 18. Um, you see computer science actually massively overrepresented in terms of um, SEND needs, uh, special educational needs. Uh, we, we're not uh, we're not sure why. Um, you know, we, we could speculate that you know, there's lots of work out there talking about how students on autism spectrum disorder uh, kind of uh, categorizations um, are more likely to be interested in things like maths and science and computing and it might be something to do with that so this is the a-level computer science um and this again needs exploring why are we seeing this huge overrepresentation of um special education lead students when they get to gcc so we'd like to get to a-level computer science um so um one of the things that I, you know, we were keen to do is to try and work out, okay, well, not just the impact in terms of who's taking it, but how do they do when they do take it? And, and one of the, uh, the criticisms leveled at the older IC qualification was that it was too easy. Um, and, you know, certainly there were, well, there still are a raft of qualifications out there, which uh, people don't really like very much. Um, but the ICT GCSC, I'm going to try and argue now, wasn't as easy as people were suggesting it was. Um, everyone thinks, oh, just because, you know, my son or daughter can do it, um, because I'm a computer science lecturer at university, um, therefore everyone's sons and daughter can, can be doing it, which is a pretty dangerous position to be um, you know, make, making kind of uh, generalizations about other people's children. Um, and, you know, building on the idea that you've got uh, this digital native that kids just know how to use technology, therefore they don't need to be taught ICT. I'm going to try and undermine a little bit of that in a second. Um, and the, here's a quote from the Royal Society report. We need a new, it has got the word creative, creative, rigorous, challenging um, computer science qualification instead of ICT, which is, you know, not creative. It's, you know, it's not rigorous and it's boring. Um, so how do people do at computer science? Again, this is a few years old, but I don't imagine the data has changed very much. And please uh, excuse this massive table. What I've done here is I've looked at all the students taking each of the subjects and, and see how they're doing against the other subjects they're also taking at the same time. So these are all the computer science students who are also taking um, uh, drama at the same time. And what this is telling you is they get a point, well, about 0 0.7 of a grade lower on average in computer science than they do in drama. So these students are finding that they are, you know, underachieving in computer science compared to drama, which is pretty worrying. Um, if the line is pretty blue, it means that they're doing pretty badly at that course in terms of other subjects. Um, and you can see French and German and Spanish show up there. Uh, but computer science is another, you know, it's a real standout line. This is, you know, a pretty difficult subject to be getting the same sort of grades as you get in other subjects. 
Um, interestingly, I've highlighted this here, which is uh, that the biggest difference between any of these um, lines is actually between computer science and maths. We very often think that computer science is all about maths and the better you are at the maths, the better you do at computer science. But, but actually the exam system, for whatever reason, is telling um, computer science students that they're pretty bad at maths. Um, sorry, pretty bad at computer science compared to maths, which is a bit uh, a bit strange. I'm not sure why that is. Um, ICT is a mixture of colours. Um, you know, it's it's not as you know as red as media. It's not as red as you know the science core. It's not as red as food tech. It's not as red as fine art. Um, you know, in if, in terms of the overall stats, ICT is pretty much mid tier. Um, ICT isn't an easy subject, which people were suggesting it was. This is GCSE, um, but it doesn't exist anymore. So it's kind of a little bit of a moot point. Um, so what we can do as well is we can find out how girls do against boys. So that's the overall stats in terms of how everyone does at computer science. Let's look at how girls do against boys. Well, you know, just to kind of uh, ruin a thing, you know, girls outperform boys. Girls are better at computer science than boys. Um, and this is not surprising because girls basically outperform um, boys at pretty much every single subject. So, you know, you shouldn't be surprised by that. I'm going to look at for their relative achievements. We need to find out how they're doing um, in computer science compared to other subjects. And if we build a model doing this, we can find out how girls and boys have similar um, attainment in other subjects, and you might say similar you know, outcomes or similar abilities, if you want to push it a bit too far, um, are, are doing against each other. So how would, uh, you know, girls and boys who are getting the same sort of grades in other subjects, how would they both do in computer science? And that can allow us to compare girls and boys of similar um, so similar attainment, similar abilities, though I think abilities is probably going a bit too far. Um, so what we do is we build this model here. We build in a model which is the attainment in computer science given the average attainment in other subjects, which is worked out by this here. Um, and then we you know, put gender into that model as well. And by this, we can then separate the impact of gender on their attainment in computer science from their attainment in other subjects. So we're looking, this will allow us to control for the attainment in other subjects and find out uh, you know, what gender explains. And what this gives us is this, um, sorry, more, lots of <laughs> big spreadsheets of, uh, of data. And what we've got here is got computer science. 60,000 students took computer science. As you can see, the average grade here is higher for females than it is for males. We knew that already, which is good. And it's this bit here that we're interested in. So the stars means that it's significant. We've got enough data here to fully say that everything's significant, except for ICT, interestingly. Um, but we are seeing that gender explains 0.31 of a grade. So just being a boy in a class means that you're going to get 0.31 of a grade more in computer science than than the girl of a similar attainment background to you. So these, you know, a girl and a boy, both of you know straight B grades, well, the boy will be getting a third of a grade more. Obviously, this is dealing with the whole population, which is why we can't say it's one grade more than two grade more. Now, um, over here on this side, uh, for those of you interested in uh, you know, effect size, actually, we've got a 0.61 effect size, which is pretty big. Uh, I've ordered this by the gender column, and you can see here that computer science is, you know, it's a bit worrying that boys are out achieving um, girls if you control for their achievement in other subjects. Uh, but physics is worse and maths is even worse. Uh, and if you go and plot the, the differences between the, 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 the explanation of gender, you see that you've got two different groups. You've got a group over here, um, which you might say is stereotypically the, uh, your boys subjects, so your STEM subjects, and a group over here, which would be kind of stereotypically your kind of your girls subjects, your art subjects. Um, and you know, th these are the stereotypes which exist in society, and actually the exam system is playing them out. Um, so the exam system is reinforcing the idea that a girl uh, thinks they're not very good at STEM by making them perform worse uh, at the same subject as a boy of a similar you know, attainment profile. Um, and that's very strange. Interestingly, ICT is, you know, is the most equitable of all of the subjects. It's not even significant. So what this is saying is it's saying that um, ICT, uh, you know, girls and boys did about the same in ICT. So a shift to computer science would mean that we're telling girls or, you know, helping girls tell themselves that they're not very good at computer science. They're not very good at digital skills. If they'd been doing ICT before, they might think more about, uh, you know, pursuing a, um, a career or further um, study in um, in computing or another digital kind of related field. Um, and that's, you know, that's our speculation. And we are hoping to look into that a little bit more to see how this kind of self-efficacy issue plays out mm -hmm. in the course of the next couple of, uh, you know, a couple of years as we're doing some research on this. So, oh, um, quick summary of this before we move on to uh, kind of questioning whether this was a good move or not. Digital education uh, decreased substantially. So we've seen decrease in qualifications, decrease in numbers. Um, there are serious disparities in access. You've, as you've seen, if you're going, if you're from a poor background or going to school, which isn't a grammar school, you're less likely to be sitting, uh, less likely to be able to sit a computer science qualification. Um, 
I am going to kind of say that we have competing qualification changes in the last eight years have not been equitable for girls, working law students, um, special education needs at UCC, not necessarily at A level, uh, and some ethnic minority groups, specifically you know, black students. Um, and the exam system that we have uh, is telling girls that they have their strengths elsewhere. The, the exam system is really hard. So girls and boys think that the course is really hard, but, you know, it's to do with where we set the uh, the grade bound is potentially, but it's telling girls in particular that they're not very good at a subject when previously, you know, they might have been doing, uh, you know, better at ICT. Uh, but we must still, you know, say that the girls do outperform the boys. And this curriculum has only been placed since about 2014. And we've got a huge amount of money through the National Centre and the efforts of the Raspberry Pi Foundation and so on being put into place to try and resolve some of the issues that I've mentioned tonight. But, you know, overall, we, you know, we are in a problematic situation. So um, quickly, just because uh, I'm going to hand over to Billy very shortly, but was the curriculum change a good idea? Well, um, you've got some concerns. Uh, you know, there's a lot of literature starting to grow around this is, there hasn't been much until recent, recently um, and you've got you know people complaining about the over influence of industry and this is a quote from the Hope and Livingston um, Next Gen uh, Nesta report from 2011 which is you know it's talking about curriculum change being there to actually kind of help industry to help visual effects and video games and and so on um, to help them you know solidify their position in the, in the world market and so on so we do have an over influence of industry potentially it's worth reading these papers to go and find out a bit more and you've also got a, a concern there that the english school system has been academized um, which means that um, schools don't have to follow the curriculum so we have a curriculum which they don't have to follow and if you don't have the right teachers then you don't actually have to um, teach any courses um, you, know, you can you can interpret the curriculum in your own way so if you don't if you're not doing well at computer science which most schools aren't um, if you can't staff it then just don't offer it um, and actually that's you know what I think we're seeing in some cases um, and then the other thing is uh, we've got you know people making these claims that um, ICT is academically weak and vocationally useless academically weak I think I've just disproven um, because that's you know the stats say it's pretty mid-tier um, and this is a John Norton the Guardian journalist the Guardian tech journalist now when we fancy that the Guardian tech journalist's son is actually quite good at tech I mean, you know I'm not surprised but we cannot overgeneralize other people's children based on our own experiences and certainly my experience of teaching is you've got children from all sorts of backgrounds particularly you know, from poorer backgrounds who really need to have some sort of you know uh, you know, help support in becoming digital natives. Um, and, you know, <laughs> you learn how to use Microsoft Word. I would love some of my, you know, A-level students in the past to have known how to use Microsoft Word because they certainly didn't. And many of you will be working in offices uh, with people who don't know and understand how to use Microsoft Word or Excel, um, you know, or other brands of office tool. Um, and then you've got, you know, this potential uh, kind of political influence here on the national curriculum, which which wasn't a, um, you know, a potentially good move for the country, which is, you know, they, they want they wanted the emphasis on computer science rather than the emphasis being on computing, the more general digital literacy, IT and computer science model. So we've got to focus on computer science rather than the other elements of computing. Um, so um, going, you know, was it useless? Uh, there's very little data trying to look at, you know, perceptions of ICT before it was uh, discontinued. Very few pieces of data which, you know, uh, aren't I suppose heavily biased um, this this one piece of data and I, I don't know what the sampling uh, method was here for Adrian Mee's work but he looks at girls in 2011 and he asked them you know to go and rank these subjects in terms of their interest uh, and in terms of their usefulness and you see ICTs you know it's better than history and geography you wouldn't dream of saying let's get rid of his, history and geography um, <laughs> because they're uninteresting but girls think ICT is more interesting so for girls ICT is actually quite an interesting and considered a useful subject um, so you know this idea that it is useful useless and uninteresting doesn't seem to be holding true for girls. Um, and what do girls like to do best? Well, um, data handling activities. If you go and see what's being taught you know, recently in the last couple of years, what do we see? Data skills, data handling skills are pretty much you know, bottom of the pile. Um, and why is this? It's probably to do with the GCSE. So the GCSE in computer science does not cover data skills, so we don't go and teach it anymore. So Adrian Me is speculating that you know we are preparing people for you know the GCSE right? so schools are saying this. They're, they're trying to prepare people for the GCSE from the age of 11. So 11 to 16 becomes preparation for the GCSE. Not everyone's going to the GCSE. The GCSE is a subset of computing. You therefore see schools covering a subset of computing, not covering the digital literacy. 
and the IT, which kids really desperately need. Um, and we have this conflict now. We have a conflict between intended policy, actual policy, and in use. So the intended policy is this stuff here. We want to have computing be this broad thing, which is you know really inclusive and has lots of uh, you know lots of digital literacy, IT, computer science, which is going to help all children. Then you go and have your um, your actual policy document. This is your national curriculum document, which is I would argue a little bit you know inclined towards the computer science side maybe more than it should be um, i was involved with drafting this so you know i am responsible for this too um and you know as we if williamson is to be believed um and there's no reason why we shouldn't believe him um then you know the the government has tried to push the computer science agenda so the actual um, documentation is they're trying to push the computer science element of this this kind of three-part model and then the in use um actual what's computing and use is what me starting to discover and what you know we're all discovering which is uh, we are focusing on computer science because that's what counts in league tables that's what schools are judged against how well the GCSE students do and if it's all about the GCSE then you're going to teach computer science and you're going to ignore some of these other ele elements as well um, so the intended is this the actual is this and the end use is, is probably a little bit more towards the computer science and this means sadly that for the great work that the national center is doing in terms of trying to cover um, you know computing as a whole uh, we're going to see schools you know I, I did a, a module on 3d animation um, but what school is going to cover 3d animation if it's not being examined at age 16 um, it's a, I think it's a good thing to cover I think it's a great thing to cover but you know it, the uh, the things that are being valued against the, the performance rate of pay is held up against GCC results and, and so on so you can see where the in use would be right I'll pass over to Billy Billy if you talk I'll change the slides for you Okay, thank you, Peter. And I will talk for about just 10 minutes. So, so far, we have established that there are different patterns of participation and outcomes in computing. And the differences between boys and girls seems to be the one that attracts most attention. Now, these patterns are, of course, in the English context, and arguably, you know, it could be similar in some other countries or perhaps in other Western uh, locations, such as the US. But we have to remember that these patterns are situated within the context of specific cultures and, and the structures of society. So we'll talk a bit more about that uh, in, the, in, the, in the next slide when I look a bit more about the sociological explanations. But what we want to do first is to look at some of the possible reasons for these patterns of underrepresentation. And we're not suggesting that these are the reasons, but just some of the suggested uh, reasons. And we're going to begin with the psychological perspectives. And I have to admit that I am not uh, a psychologist. It's not my area of expertise. So if you have any questions or critiques about this, do ask Peter about it. Uh, but we do want to acknowledge that at the individual and the personal level, each of us can have a different way of thinking that may reflect our personality or our preferences. And the first type of research uh, in this area uh, looks into natural differences between individuals, especially between the historical application of the binary sex, so between females and males, and how certain ways of thinking are inherently more likely for boys and for girls. So the argument here is that there are biological differences which may explain different interests or abilities. And one of the arguments here is that boys tend to make up most of the autistic individuals, which Peter touched on earlier on, and autistic traits seems to be related to interest in uh, math science and computer science. So the logic here drawn on Baron Cohen's empathizing, empathizing systemizing theory, uh, it, the logic follows that if autistic traits are more likely uh, to be related to interest in computer science, and boys are more likely to have autistic traits than girls, then boys on average will be more likely to have an interest in computing than girls. Now, of course, this is just one possible explanation and there are other reasons, of course, and there are also concerns that perhaps the number of uh, autistic girls are, are underreported. So the second branch of research uh, is perhaps more popular and that is around the concept of self-efficacy, which focuses on the belief uh, in the ability to succeed or achieve something. So very much like the saying, if you think you can, you can. And conversely, if you don't have the self-confidence or belief in yourself, then you're less likely to do it and less likely to succeed. And in the context of gender, uh, studies have found that boys tend to have higher self-efficacy than girls, 
which of course does not mean girls, uh, boys do better than girls, are uh, quite the opposite as we already shown in the patterns. Uh, but the relative strengths of girls in non-STEM subjects such as in English could make girls feel that they are less skilled in math and the sciences, including computing, which may also relate to this idea of academic emotions, which I've read from a blog by Hayley Leonard, who I believe is in the audience. Um, moving to the next slide, please. So I'm, I'm gonna look into the sociological explanations for these patterns, um, with the emphasis here more on social structures and the ways in which society can function to make experiences or choices much easier or harder for certain groups to participate or achieve. So the first theme of research is almost a continuation of the idea of self-advocacy, but with a stronger focus on the acceptance or approval of others as well as from the self. So research in STEM education uh, more broadly has highlighted the challenges and struggles for some students to see themselves as a STEM person. Now, for computing, there is a popular discourse surrounding the idea of the computing genius, the whisked, so to speak, which can influence how young people identify with computing, computing education, and computing careers. And this is closely linked to the second theme around stereotypes and expectations. So for some students, being good with computers and programming in particular, is quite an attractive identity. But for others, the idea of being a computing person might be quite undesirable or even inconsistent with their other student identities, including how they are perceived by others. Now, our earlier research around the career aspirations of digitally skilled teenagers found a gender divide in terms of uh, how boys seem to prefer the technical computing jobs while girls want to use the computing skills for creative purpose. And this may reflect how computer scientists are often portrayed in the media, such as the male geek or nerd who is clever, but also socially awkward. So these stereotypes can reinforce the idea that computing is perhaps a male domain. Now to understand differences between ethnic groups, we will require more research, but drawn on studies in the science context where I've done uh, some of my previous work in, there are certain careers and professions that are considered by some ethnic groups to be more respectable as well as more achievable. And that can offer us some insights into the patterns relating to ethnicity. So the question here really is, are computing uh, and computing careers desirable for ethnic minority students and their families? On social class, there is also limited research, but again, the patterns uh, which we've mentioned earlier shows that those from a poorer background are impacted the most, which is again, consistent with wider STEM education research, which also allows us to bring in the concept of science capital or even STEM capital. So, and the suggestion here is that for some groups of students, especially those from a working class background or uh, underprivileged background, uh, they don't, continue in this pathway because they lack science capital, uh, which refers to the knowledge, the resources, and the social networks that can strengthen young people's participation and engagement in science and STEM. Now, Peter also touched on intersectionality and in sociological research, we are always very conscious of the interacting and the multiple forms of inequalities. For example, the patterns we found on white working class girls as being more likely to study computing than the white middle-class girls counterparts will again merit further research. Finally, we also touch on this briefly, individual schools and teachers can certainly play a key role in the subject choices and the career aspirations of their pupils. So aside from school structures and policies, which may, as mentioned already, limit who can and who cannot study, advanced computing, typically based on you know, previous attainments. The ways teachers teach and the topics that are covered can influence how students identify, aspire, and achieve in computing. And again, more work is needed and uh, some work is already underway to understand this dynamic, which also takes us to the next slide, please. 
And this is just to share the news and links to what we've been talking about. Uh, so we're pleased to share the news that we'll be starting a new project in March that aims to better understand the subject choices and the attainments of underrepresented students in computing, especially girls. So the study will be funded by the Nuffield Foundation uh, based at King's and there are two strands. The first strand is going to be a greater and a deeper analysis of the data uh, drawn on the National People Database as well as the school workforce census. As Peter mentioned, some of the data we've got at the moment is a bit outdated, so this project will enable us the capacity to really dig deeper into the various uh, angles. The second strand uh, will be case studies of schools with a high proportion of girls who are studying computing at GCSE. So the idea is that we want to see if there are any lessons that we can learn and amplify for other schools. So we've listed the three key overarching research questions. Uh, the project will run, will run for three years, so uh, watch this space. Uh, final slide, please. So to conclude, we've got some questions for us to discuss. And uh, as mentioned at the beginning uh, by Sue and Diana, there's going to be a breakout room. Uh, so in our presentation, we explore the different patterns of underrepresentation. So the first question is asking ourselves, is this normal and expected, or should we be concerned? Secondly, should there be different approaches to address the underrepresentation of different groups? In other words, should initiatives be targeted or available to all? Thirdly, are some forms of computing more inclusive than others? And the final question may be relevant for future seminars as well. What can teachers and practitioners realistically do to support the participation and engagement of underrepresented students in computing? Uh, so that's it from us, or well, from me anyway. Uh, I will now pass it back to Diana or Sue. Uh, back to me, yeah, okay. thank you very much. Let's give you a sort of a wave or a quick clap of hands or whatever, both of you. That was really, really great. Um, and uh, lots and lots to talk about. The chat has gone mad. Um, there's loads of comments in the chat, people exchanging references and everything. So I think people have lots of things to talk about. And thanks for sharing those questions. And if anywhere we could copy them into the chat so that we could um, take them with us into the breakout groups. Um, but without further ado, um, I think Diana's going to put us into the groups for 15, so 15 minutes. And um, I suggest that when you get into your breakout group, the first thing you do, is do a quick round, just introduce yourselves to everybody. Don't spend all 15 minutes doing that. Um, and then you can use the Zoom whiteboard function to, to, to make notes and get your great questions. Uh, don't forget to save it before we come back so that you can um, refer to it. Otherwise, you'll lose it when you come back. And um, without any further ado, Diana, you can press the, do your, do your stuff. Okay, so um, I hope you had a good um, conversation in your um, groups. And um, so you can ask questions in several ways. You can wave at me. You can raise your hand on, the, um, on, on Zoom, um, or you can um, put your question in the chat. And I, it's much nicer if people can, ask, you know, verbalize their own questions rather than me read them out. Um, so let's do the, let's try the waving thing first. Who, who'd like to answer, ask a question from their, um, from their group? Sujit, you'd like to ask the first question. Uh, yeah, my question is that, uh, uh, why do we uh, focus on the underrepresented students? What I feel is that this is, uh, all the problems that we have discussed is true for all students. Like, you know, in UK and I see we have less number of students in all postcode. I know what the postcode schools and other stuff are, but why do we only talk about underrepresented students? I feel this is a uh, problem which is there for all the schools, except for the private schools. So can we dwell a bit on that part? Why, do we, why don't we have good representation of or quality, a quantity of students in STEM in UK overall. Um, is Peter or Billy do you want to pick up that question? Uh, I, I can handle that. So yeah, uh, it, it's a very good question. Uh, it's partly because Sue asked me to do something on underrepresented students. Uh, <laughs> if that's an answer. Um, but you know, I, I also you know, I, I think it's a very good point because certainly if we're looking at this idea of the digital native, this idea that children just teach themselves. Um, computing and digital technology, which you know, it's pretty much universally not true. Um, we, 
you know, we do need to focus on getting additional education for any students. And the, the first couple of slides, which I'm uh, trying to focus on that a little bit, which is the number of hours. So it's certainly in the UK, we've seen a decrease in the number of hours, which can only be a bad thing if children are just trying to pick up general digital skills, because it should be those lessons where they're picking up these general digital skills, including elements of computer science. Um, and we, you know, we have seen, you know, almost a collapse in the number of qualifications taken, a collapse in the number of hours um, of computing offered at, uh, at age 16. Um, and this, you know, this is deeply concerning. But I think, as Sue's mentioned in the comments here, um, you know, England is, is a place which has a curriculum between five and 16. And we have uh, compulsory computing, supposedly up to the age of 16. Um, I think in reality, for some students, it ends at 12. Um, and for many students, it ends at 13, 14. Um, but, you know, we do have a compulsory curriculum, certainly at primary school, which should be delivered and actually is something that we should be, you know, should be proud of and celebrating. So thank you for pointing that out, Sue. That's a, that's a good point. And thank you for the question, CJ, if that's answered your question. OK. Um, do you want to follow up that, Sujit? Do you want to come back and, uh, and say something else? Yeah, just one minute. One thing, Peter, when we are doing this kind of analysis, statistical analysis, is it not better to give an absolute number rather than this percentage? Because uh, what, uh, what I'm a bit scared about this percentage is that it is not reflecting the total number. Like, you know, if there are two, uh, two ethnic minority students and one fail, you get suddenly 50% failing, but you really don't know this is two among 80 or what, what kind of thing? So uh, is it not better to have absolute figures as well in uh, with, along with the uh, along with the percentage. Um, I, all I can do is, and everyone would say, please read the paper. Um, so the uh, the end numbers are in the paper, and um, you know I think that's that's a good point too. The smallest group that you're looking at in terms of <clears throat> sorry ethnicity was the the group of Chinese students. So I think it was about. I forget now, I'm not going to even give you the figure, but the figure's in there. It's still, you know, it's still something which would have some statistical power, um, but it's a much lower number than white students. You know, the, the number of Chinese students is, is the smallest ethnic grouping that we were looking at. Um, so yeah, if you re read the paper, which I think has been linked out to you, um, all the end numbers are in there and you can you know, pick that apart and uh, you're welcome to drop me an email and talk talk about numbers if you, if you so wish. I'd be more than happy to do that. Okay, thank you so much, Peter. Okay, thank you. Uh, Duncan, did you have a question? We're just scratching your ear. <laughs> um, so and any other questions coming in? Um, I can take questions from the chat. There was, oh, Richard, do you want to, to say something? Uh, you might want to unmute. Yeah, okay, good. No, it, it, I thought it was a brilliant um, layout of the, of the issue. I mean, I think it's a, it's a massive issue. But really, following up from Sujit, my question would be, how many computer science qualified people do we need in our society within our industrial society, industrial society, industrial strategy for the UK? Because that's clearly the thing that's got to drive it. So if we want engineers, if we want AI, machine learning, autonomy, all the stuff we're going to need from the next fourth industrial revolution, how many computer science qualified students do we need? And that they should then set the strategy. The underrepresented bit has got to be dealt with. But the bigger issue is we need a lot more, I think. I mean, not just a little bit more, we need a vast amount more, particularly showing the, the graphs earlier. I was quite shock, shocked by that, the, the downturn in the number of uh, people taking it. So I would say you've got to take a top level view about what we need as a society. And that should be the starting point. Uh, so, sorry, I, sorry, Billy, if you want to come in or... No, go ahead. So I, I think this is a you know a good point, but it also then rubs up against the idea of industry dictating what we're teaching in schools. Um, I believe there's a figure being banded around of they're looking for about two hundred fifty thousand students a year doing computer science. Um, but you know, I would I would like to argue that some of the other skills which were covered by um, by the old IT qualification, you know, around data analysis, the use of spreadsheets, the presentation of data and so on, are also really, really important. And where previously we just assumed they were being covered, because they were, there were qualifications, this was being taught in schools, these things are disappearing. And actually, um, it would be interesting to see if businesses are now going to complain that, oh, look, I've got all these students coming and they have no idea, they, they can program in Python, basic programming in Python, but they have no idea how to you know, make a graph in a spreadsheet, or they have no idea how to use you know, tables in a, in a 
presentation or uh, and that sort of stuff. So um, I think say the figures two hundred and fifty thousand. We've got about seventy six thousand currently doing computer science. I so say the numbers are leveled out. It might go up again in the future. Um, this is obviously whether you know a lot of the government thinking was coming from that we want to you know match the needs of industry. Industry were very vocal in the curriculum change. Um, but it's whether this curriculum change is now reducing the other skills that people have been taking for granted um, and you know, just general digital skills which are needed across all industries, not just um, you know, the, the tech industry, not just AI. Um, so, yeah, I, I think industry does need to play a part. I'm not suggesting that it shouldn't, but maybe we've gone too far in one direction. And I don't think that's, you know, the fault of industry, because obviously industry will always try and get more people to you know, come into that industry. That's in various industries will fight for their corner but um maybe the other the other side the softer side the softer uh, computing skills have been uh, left behind and we might see a skill shortage in that area in the very near future um sorry richard if that's a bit bit kind of around the houses if that, <laughs> if that got to your question or not i'm not sure i think i think that's interesting and i think um i can see i've got jane next and andrew but if i'm permitted to say something as chair the um you talk about digital literacy i mean across we can do introduce that across the curriculum um from you know across in all subjects you know some of the things that in that employers are looking for and i think that's also something that we need in the in england to um be make sure we're doing as well um that was just a comment right i'll go to jane next and then andrew the hand up thing is working i can see the yellow hands um, I'm actually putting my hand up for Keridig because he was assigned the person to speak for our group. So Keridig, he's tried to do a virtual hand waving through the chat and failed. Oh, I can't see. I'm sorry. So Keridig, uh, where are you? I, I, I hashtag, I'm, I'm, I don't know where I am in this. There's about 18 people in <laughs> a first year and there's yeah. like hundreds now. Um, <laughs> I just think, I mean, there are two things which bug me and they have bugged me for a while. And that is firstly, you know, one slide shows that computer science and information technology and digital literacy are, are three separate circles on a Venn diagram. And ICT used to be a, 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 or was a very devalued qualification, 98% passes, all the rest of this. And the government have basically said, right, at GCSE, we're having computer science and it's going to focus on that computer science circle. And then we've not lost ICT at all. That's a total fallacy. It's in the vocational sector and it's worth performance points in the same way that GCSE is. And both Pearson and ourselves and AQL, I think, have got, you know, BTECs, digital certificates, equivalent GCSEs in ICT, which cover data handling, spreadsheets, data you know, presentation, data manipulation. So that's that ICT circle is covered. And we've got Creative Eye Media and an, another exam board has a very similar qualification that covers animation, sound, graphics, video, you know, producing all these sorts of things as well. So we actually have three qualifications that cover those three segments. And the presentation as posed today said, we've just suddenly lost all these students taking computer science. When actually computer science is a new subject. So I'd argue you can't lose students you're gaining them because it's a brand new qual and also it doesn't reflect the uptake in numbers across the other two qualifications which are both valid options and cover the other sections of that venn diagram so the question is are we or is this driven by a, a want to go back to a gcse and ict which is a very practical subject and requires coursework and in the uk coursework in gcses is pretty much now unheard of and therefore actually we're getting a very imbalanced view of our digital sort of qualification space and uptake and also if girls as as in the um sort of I believe one of the slides you know enjoy more data ma manipulation and, and things down that route well in that case there's a qualification out there that does match those skills so are we comparing like with like at the moment or is this just a very much ict is the new computer science vice versa which it really isn't and therefore those qualifications don't quite hold from that point of view um and also there's an interesting statistic um the A-level this year was the most successful A-level uh, in terms of growth. We've got an 11% growth A-level. It's on the rise. We're seeing more and more students taking it. The gender balance in A-level is better than, than it ever has been. So again, I, I feel we're actually maybe doing a disservice by focusing on the negatives. And maybe we should be saying, well, look, this is working. We are making progress. And why is this? Rather than potentially uh, a flip side of viewing. Those are my two points.
Okay, Peter. Do you want okay, to so um, sorry, lots to unpack there. Um, are we comparing like with like? Well, you know, I I have included the qualifications that you're talking about in that blue line that we saw on the chart earlier. Um, all those qualifications are there. So I, you know, I, I understand these qualifications do exist, but in England we have kind of the gold standard of A level and GCSE, and the gold standard. Um, you know, there, there are other qualifications in there, which, as you've just spoken about, some schools will not offer these qualifications. Some parents will not want their children to sit these qualifications, and some, um, you know, some students will not want to sit these qualifications. And for those qualifications, the, the whole qualification space, you're talking about nine minutes per student per week. Um, when for the GCSE, um, we're looking at probably two and a, two and a half hours a week. Um, so there's, you know, there's a big disparity. If the charts weren't showing what they were in terms of number of hours and number of qualifications, um, I would be, you know, you know, probably celebrating the diversity of qualifications that are out there. But sorry, just to interject there, Peter, a GCSE, a Creative Eye Media or a BTEC is still offered in the same qual space as a computer science one, and they will still get two and a half hours per week as a GCSE equivalency. This isn't a key stage three or anything else course. So that yes, nine minutes yeah. versus two and a half hours seems inaccurate yeah but I, i'm saying that the general population as you know as the graphs show um are getting far less and you know digital qualification or digital education full stop um, in key now, stage three no 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 this is this is a key stage three key stage four key stage five the qualifications at age 16 are down by 50 percent in the last couple of years now you might argue that some of the old qualifications weren't you know worth the paper they were printed on or, or whatever but at least it was something rather than nothing which I, I, mean, I, I hate to be in a position where i'm saying look having some digital qualification or some digital education is better than nothing but that's kind of what we're left with for many children and you've getting you're getting children from you know age potentially age 12 getting no you know, no qualification from a three-year GCSE or three-year um, BTEC or three-year um, OCR national and so on. Um, and that's, you know, that's really you know, deeply concerning. Now, yes, I mean, you're right. We're not comparing light with lights. I'm, I am not here arguing to go back to the old ICT qualification. I was involved with writing a draft for a new IT qualification at GCSE and A-level, as I think you were too. And I think, you know, there, there was a lot of um, kind of educational will to get this done and to, to get a, a broader scope of qualifications at GCSC level and A level. Uh, the government decided not to do that. So we are left with vocational um, and vocational, as I've just said, um, are not looked on as highly by some groups as, uh, as others. Um, so then you get a two tier system, you get, you know, um, and I think Adrian Mead talks about this a bit as well. So you get, oh, they're the bright kids, they're the, you know, they're the ones that are going to go to places, you can do computer science, everyone else you can go do these vocational qualifications. That's not what we want. You know, we, we don't want a two tier system where some students get one thing and other students get something else. Now, um, I, I know that uh, you know, these qualifications are, you know, are rigorous, are good, are all those things. Um, but it's, you know, it's unfortunately, it isn't like, like as you say, um, and the, the space, the, the computing education we have in England is turning into a two tier or three tier system because some people get absolutely nothing. Um, so I, Sorry, I'm trying, and yeah, uh, I think that's covered it. So, and it's, it's good to finally speak to you because I've had a couple of emails and I'd be more than happy to uh, continue by email on this. But if there's anything else you want to follow up with now, um, please do, otherwise, that's, yeah. That's great. It's both, um, it, it's a really interesting line about the vocational and how, they, how, we, how we incorporate that into when we're talking about what opportunities that people have over 14. Just be aware, it's, a, it's an international audience. So uh, the more we get into England, no, yeah. some people are kind of going to going to fall asleep or get lost. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, so I'm just going to move on to Andrew. Your question next, and then Duncan. Hi, I don't really know whether it's a question or not. It's really coming back at what somebody was saying earlier about um, being led by by industry, and and my job is to teach computer science teachers um, to go into schools and teach computer science. Now. To reply just to, um, to the previous gentleman, you know, there is no PGCE in, in, in ICT um, or iMedia. Um, and that's, that's had an impact on the kind of people I can take on my course, because there's a lot of people who are coming in with these degrees in the creative industries sort of sector, but they can't do programming in the way that I'd like them to be able to for, for doing a, a PGCE in computer science. But that aside, the reason I do computer science the reason I love this subject is because it's about problem solving. It's about breaking down a situation and a problem 
and building a solution, whether that be writing code or whether that be life. And therefore, I see computer science as a key skill. So computer science isn't, for me, about achieving GCSE results, league tables, or anything else. It's about a life skill. And therefore, it does need to be incorporated into every uh, key stage three, four, five curriculum um, to some degree. And it's not about industry. It's about problem solving and giving the, the kids the tools to be able to succeed in later life. And that's not about teaching them Excel or whatever else. Using Excel to understand formulas, yes. Teaching them about Excel, no. Teaching them animations, yes. Teaching them to use Flash, no. That's my point. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, that's fine. Peter or Billy, do you want to, to comment back? Just, um, well, yeah, in, in agreement. Um, and, you know, we, we do need to get away from teaching technologies and we do need to get away from uh, you know, the idea that they're going to be qualified in Flash. Because, I mean, you would have had a pretty bad week last week if you were qualified. <laughs> um, and, yeah. you know, we, you know, we, we do need to look at these general skills, but it's not to say that these skills don't also exist in the IT side of things. So, you know, if you go, uh, I used to get the train through Canary Wharf, which is our big industrial centre in London um, every day, and you'd look through the windows and, you know, they, they weren't very careful with their, with their blinds. You could see everyone was on um, a spreadsheet doing something with the spreadsheet. And, you know, it's, it's those, those sort of skills, having spreadsheet skills can really help you work in business. They can help you start to analyze, uh, you know, lost footpaths in your local kind of walking group. You know, those sort of things are, are really essential too. And we, we do need to have this kind of general skills of which programming is going to be one of them. Um, and that, I think the World Society does a good job of listing those, those three areas. And so the says, you know, three separate areas. Well, I don't think they're separate. I think they are actually overlapping. There's a lot of overlap between these. And, you know, uh, it's, it is a shame that some, I mean, some university courses are calling it, teach, uh, you become a PGC in computer science, but it's not, it's PGC in computing. And, you know, some of the terminology issues here are probably um, going to put people off as well. Great. Um, so I'm going to ask Duncan his question, then I'm going to come to some of the people writing questions in the chat or comments in the chat. So Tracy uh, and um, maybe Angela wants to ask something, but we'll do Duncan next. You are on mute, I believe. There we go. Sorry. Yeah. So um, it follows on from Andrew's point and your point earlier, Sue, about the cross-curricular approaches. I just wondered: is anything being done at a national level? Are we are we missing a trick here in perhaps taking more like a media comp computation approach? I see Mark's just joined us of motivating the subject in its own right, but also embedding it in the curriculum of, you know, if you're doing chemistry, you can be doing computing there. If you're doing humanities, you could be, you know, doing some data science in geography. If you're doing humanities, you could be doing natural language processing. I just wonder, are we missing a trick here? Is there more and how could we go about getting computing as well as a separate subject, having it embedded in other parts of the curriculum? Yeah, what do you think, Peter and Billy, or, do, or anybody else want to comment on that? Not... And Naomi, do you want to come into onto that point? Amusingly, um, quite a long time ago, I did some work um, as a computer as a computer science IT teacher across the whole school, um, because I was interested in that exact question: what was it that we weren't teaching in IT or computer science? Because we did it kind of both together. That actually everybody needed the students to be able to do. Do you know what shocked me? It freaked me out. All of the teachers who I talked about were concerned that the students couldn't actually type. That made um, like a difference to me because I thought, goodness gracious me, okay. So as the science teachers were pointing out, well, we're trying to do this investigation, but actually the students don't know how to put the information into a computer very quickly. And that's causing us problems. The English department came back and said the same thing. Um, and I found personally, when I was working with my colleagues, the best thing to do was teach the people who were teaching how to teach those skills, as well as teaching them in their IT, in IT lessons, so that every teacher could then be doing that. And if that meant sitting down and showing someone how to use a spreadsheet, 
I did that if it meant to, um, having um, like whole staff briefing sessions on how to use Google Forms to do quizzes. It meant doing that or videoing things so that people could go back and through it and through it because actually that led to better joined up um, like IT computer science stuff going on because we had that kind of collaborative um, development. I mean, it's absolutely fantastic in a way when you can get it across the school, but it, it also requires specific teaching as well. We plan schemes of work so that, for example, when um, science, we're going to be doing some work on um, data, we'd actually already taught the students how to use spreadsheets, for example, so that when they went off to do their experiments and came back with the data, they could do it in IT, but also they could do it with their like science teachers. And that was where it really started to pull off. Equally, design technology, doing stuff to do with CAD software, that kind of thing. Anyway, we could talk about that for hours. Um, can I just sorry just uh, respond to that? I think it's a very interesting point um, about this this cross curricular teaching and what you just suggested there, Naomi, is you were you know you were giving them the foundations of how to use spreadsheets and then it was used in other subjects. And I think absolutely we should have digital technology in all subjects because it's you know, part of everyday life and they need to be using it. Um, in England, we've got a particular problem, which is no other subject demands the use of IT, even you know, maths, and you don't need to use spreadsheets in maths. You do data analysis, but you draw your graphs on paper, and the same with science and, and so on. They, they might do it, but they don't have to do it. Um, and, you know, if I used to teach uh, liter literacy, I suppose, and numeracy in my ICT lessons when I was teaching ICT, um, but I wouldn't pretend to know how to teach, you know, literacy and numeracy. That was that was what was happening in maths and in and in English, and I was just there to help them, you know, practice and, and try and conceptualize it within the computing domain um, or with the ICT domain. And it's probably the same. If we're going to have this cross curricular, you need to have some foundation. You need to have some you know, explicit teaching of this so that they can then go and make use of these skills in other subjects. And that specific use of these digital skills will be delivered through a computing lesson. Um, that's my argument. And then you go and see more of it in other lessons too. Um, I've just if I, um, realized that we're running out of time. So I'm sorry to, um, to, I won't be able to take any more questions now, um, but because it's now 6.30 and we need to finish, but that was a fantastic um, discussion and lots of animation in the, um, in the questions and so much in the chat that um, I think Diana will probably capture it somewhere, all those great points. And uh, thank you very much again to Peter and Billy. Um, let's give them a silent clap. The hashtag is there on this um, slide and also Peter and Billy's um, Twitter handles. If you want to sign up for any more information about what's going on in our um, research activities, there's the link there. And if Diana, if you just um, forward, that we've got, as I said at the beginning, we're doing this series of diversity and inclusion seminars. So these are the ones that are coming up. We've got February, we've got, um, um, next we've got Tia Madkins, um, who's also uh, um, speaking with Nicole Howard and Shamari Jones. Then we've got um, Jahitita Thomas, then my Israel. Then we've got uh, Cecily Morrison from UK. And then I do know who is in June, but I'm not going to tell you, I'll keep that for a surprise. Um, and uh, so loads of things around diversity and inclusion to, for you to come and um, listen to. So thank you so much for your participation. Um, it's just brilliant that we've got so many people here. You're all really engaged and listening to each other and hopefully the conversations in the breakout rooms were really rewarding as well. So I just like to say um, it's half past six in the evening for me. So I'm off to have my dinner. You're probably off to have your breakfast or your lunch, wherever you've come from. Um, but thank you very much to coming along. Um, do say goodbye in the chat. And um, goodbye from all of us. Thank you very much.